Now, Loki Trends, with episode five? What, was there no football on this Thursday? I was shocked. You know, word was that this was a filler episode, and while I watched it, I was like, oh yeah, it is a filler episode, and I almost dismissed it. And I think the reason I thought it was a filler episode, well, I think the real reason is is because I'm a lot like Loki. So I went for the logical uh, evaluation instead of the emotional one, which I think all of, so, well, at least so many of you did, which is why this episode finally spoke to people. They got you in the feels. But anyway, when I first watched it, I was like, Loki didn't need everyone's temporal aura because he learned to control his time slipping at the end of the episode. So I was just like, well, what did we do all that for? It was an emotional journey, that's why. Uh, And as I said, I wrote this episode off and I was going to wait to break it down. But then I saw it trending and I was like, why is this one trending? And the others didn't. And it forced me to go back and look at it right away. And as I said, I think it got everyone in the feels. And when I think about it, I think that's what, as I said, I think that I was like Loki. You know, and I was being very logical and trying to solve the problem and being action oriented when it was all about taking a pause and thinking about again how you feel. Isn't that interesting? And Loki needed to really feel that loss. This episode had him hit rock bottom. And that's what pushed him to ultimately be able to control his time slipping. Oh, that's right. Loki got a new power. It's not as he says, where, when, or even why, It's who, which means it's not just emotional because that would be the why. That would be his self-motivation. And it's, that's true. It's even beyond himself. Loki has to look beyond himself. Uh, I'm a lot like Loki. (laughs) Uh, It takes, uh, you know, it's a lot to admit it under these circumstances, but I'll do it. It's late. I'm feeling a little sherry, but any, you know, to share, but in the share circle. But anyway, Loki It's about an emotional connection. That's really what was going on here. And that's amazing. Loki has learned to connect, to care, and he cares very deeply for his friends. Well, I think to some degree because he doesn't want to be alone anymore, which takes it back to him, but he does care very much about them. But you know what's interesting? Again, this is a very interesting episode, but I think that all of his friends, when we met them here on the timeline, finally, they seem very alone as well. Didn't you get that vibe, right? Even if they're not physically alone, they're emotionally alone. And perhaps that's what made them candidates for the TVA and why Loki fits in with that group so well. Ah, fascinating. So I was right last week with my predictions, or at least for the first part of the episode, right? So Loki, who did not reset when the timelines exploded because he was pruned from all of time in episode one, got that right and that stuck. And then Loki, like me, like my my assumption, thought that he needed to find his friends in their real lives on the timeline and re-recruit them to the TVA, but this time allow it to be their choice, which again is what I predicted. And I was like, oh, I got it right. And as I said, that's why I think I, I gravitate towards Loki as a character because I have a lot of similarities to him, including, uh, you know, we made the same mistake. We went for the logical action oriented thing instead of taking the break, stopping, letting our guard down, which is really hard to do for us Lokis and going for that emotional connection. Oh, it's blowing my mind. Very rarely do you look into the, uh, to an episode and see yourself staring back. By the way, did you notice they're all on branched timelines? Oh, I liked that. So that would mean that he who remains recruited them and then pruned their timelines. So when time reset at the end of episode four, those timelines all reappeared and everyone rejoined them. So that's that's very interesting. Uh, I wonder what happens, what's going to happen now? I mean, will those timelines remain pruned? Uh, That's interesting. I guess maybe we'll find the answer to that in episode six. But anyway, obviously, what we have to do in this breakdown is rank the reveals of everyone's life on the timeline, right? In order of awesomeness, starting with the most awesome, which is obviously, let's see if we all have the same one, Mobius. Ah, it was close between Mobius and OB. But again, this episode was ultimately about the feels, and I had a lot of feels with Mobius. So share your own rankings down below. But I suspect you all have, well, some of you might have OB. OB was good. All right, so anyway. 
Now there's two ways to read Mobius's or Don's relation. We've got his real name. Uh, I don't know, Don, Owen Wilson doesn't look like a Don to me. But anyway, to read his, he looks like a Tim or something, to read his relationship with his sons, right? On the one hand, you could say they're variants of Odin, Loki, and Thor, right? Which is kind of the setup in their interaction. But I think if you really want to be fair about it, both of his sons are kind of, well, let's say rascally, to put it politely. So one could argue that Mobius is simply a patient father, and while he doesn't realize it because his mind's been wiped so many times, Loki reminds him of his sons. Uh, but either way, that would make Mobius a father figure to Loki, and I don't like that read, so I, don't, I reject that. <laughs> <laughs> even if maybe that's what the writers are going for. So maybe, I kept thinking about it because I was like, don't like that. So maybe I'd argue that Mobius, or again, Don, was forced to be responsible when his wife left. Oh, that's sad. Uh, and so he's, again, I said, feeling very alone. So he's drawn to Loki, the cool kid, who in, is in a way everything that Mobius would like to be. The guy who actually drives a jet ski instead of pretending to drive one. There has to be some meaning behind that choice. That was a very interesting choice. That I, I, that, that has to maybe be it. And I, I, mean, I, I mean, I don't love this e either, but it's better than the father figure uh, theory. Uh, but you know what? I did catch what all the shippers caught, and I knew the shippers would love it, and that was how nervous Loki was to meet Mobius in Mobius's real life, right? Loki very much wanting to look his best, fixing his hair. And sure enough, I saw a lot of you go crazy about that online. But with these, uh, you know, if you're not gonna go with the shipping angle, and I saw it, I saw it there. I mean, I, there was definitely a glimmer of that that they put in the show. But if you don't wanna go in that direction, is it the son wanting to impress the father, right? Is it that? Uh, or is it maybe Loki not wanting to disappoint the only person who's ever believed in him? I like that. That's the best read of the situation, in my opinion, that I was able to come up with. But I'm curious to how you would, what you think, what kind of insight you think this episode brought to their relationship. There's definitely something there. Maybe it's a little bit of all of it. All right, next would be, as I said, clearly, OB, who embodies the title of this episode, Science Fiction. And the TV, TVA, of course, lives, well, I was going to say the Nexus, but Nexus event is, um, is a, a term on, in the TVA, so I didn't want to use it, but I like that it kind of fits. But, you know, that's where the TVA lives, in between science and fiction. And, of course, we've talked about how... You know, the first Thor movie had that line about what is uh, is fiction, uh, you know, magic is, is, you know, eventually becomes science. And even earlier, Victor Timely had that line about everything is fiction until it can become fact. Uh, so you kind of have that continuing. Now, uh, on, on, on his timeline, OB is a failed sci-fi writer with a man cave that mirrors his office at the TVA. Uh, but also, he's a theoretical physics professor. I thought that was great. And, I, and he, so he's a mix. OB himself embodies science and fiction. I looked up Yorin. It's not from Marvel. The only thing I could find was Game of Thrones. So I guess it's a Game of Thrones reference, maybe? Uh, and I couldn't make out Obi's name, his, his uh, name on the timeline. But anyway, I really like the way that he spoke to Loki, like a teacher, a very, very good teacher. Science being what and how, while fiction is why, was in fact my favorite line from the episode. I think because it reminded me of like a really good class in screenwriting. I was like, ah, that's a, that's a fantastic distinction. I love that. Obi also realizes that Loki is turning into a tempad himself. Oh, isn't that great? I was going to say a human tempad, but Loki's not a human. He's a god. Uh, that he's going to be able to slip through time and space all on his own, which is very cool. And I think another sign of where the season and Loki are ultimately headed. And again, as I said, Loki got himself a new power. That's, that's very interesting. Although, I don't know what he's going to do with this on, in the big picture, uh, although the TV, you know, in the MCU, although the TVA is becoming more and more important to the overall story, um, how could Loki not factor into uh, Kang Dynasty and Deadpool Season 3? I mean, Deadpool 3. <laughs> I'm thinking about Disney Plus shows and movies at the same time. Um, they, it's all blurring together. Uh, what have you done, Kevin Feige? But anyway, I haven't heard about, I haven't heard rumors or from any of my sources that Loki is in there, but 
could Marvel really keep anything a secret these days? I mean, they're so bad at it. I'm curious as to how they're going to make this all uh, fit together. I hope they do. Uh, but anyway, all right, so how cool is it that Loki gives OB the TVA guidebook just as Renslayer gives it to Victor Timely earlier in the season? Oh, I love that. And of course, they both co-created TVA technology in a way. Again, it's the snake eating its own tail, Ouroboros symbol. Uh, also, the two books are kind of also the same symbol, a snake eating its own tail, even with Obi's picture in the back. You don't know when one ends and one begins. I love that. And so Obi, when he's given the guidebook, is able to build his own tempad, uh, and it, it takes him over a year, and he loses his job, and apparently he was married too, but he loses his wife. Again, they're all very alone. I think that's a common thread for sure. Uh, but we don't know that it took so long. That was a good gag, because with the tempad, he can travel through space and time, so it seems like, you know, he just showed up. By the way, I thought this was a little bit of a throwback to the Goonies as well, with the makeshift tempad. Seeing Kei Huy Kwan, Hui Kwan in so many fantastical stories lately, it was really refreshing to see him more in the real world. And I, it really felt like you were seeing Short Round all grown up. And I think that's because particularly in the bookstore, it did have a little bit of a Spielbergian feel. I like that. Uh, then next, I would have to go with B-15, who is a pediatrician we discover in New York City, which fits her caring nurturing, but still no nonsense attitude. Although she should have written that warning on that little girl's cast the other way around because the little girl can't read it herself. It's upside down to her. And that really bothered me. I was like, it's not a warning to her. It's a warning to others. She should have written, don't let me climb trees on the cast because that little girl can't read it herself. It was just a little thing that really upset me. <laughs> All right. So then, well, I don't think Sylvie really fits in here because she had a different set of rules. So last, in my opinion, was Casey, uh, who, who uh, pulled a, a Shawshank Redemption, but out of Alcatraz in the 1960s. It was a funny line when they said, you're going to have to find your own way off this island. And then Loki just time slipped out of there. And I thought that was great. Uh, but while these sequences were beautifully shot, the shot where Casey was looking up at the light from down below uh, in the tunnels, that was great. And Eugene Cordero has a really cool uh, face, was particularly well highlighted by the light, but he's not a good enough actor to pull these scenes off. I didn't buy him as the thief. I didn't, get, I didn't buy it at all, in fact. But I could see why they did it from a writing perspective because it was a good, it was a good misdirect to think that he stole the crude tempad to you know, commit crimes in time and space. But in fact, that timeline had also started to unravel. So that was good. That was well set up. Uh, and then with Sylvie, we went back to McDonald's, where I think the timeline was already starting to unravel there already, because that's what happened to Sylvie's food. When it wasn't there, I thought we were going to cut to Loki eating it. Be I was like, is Loki going to eat French fries? I would love to see that. But he wasn't. But I forgot about the food because I was just so wrapped up in their reunion. But I think that's what happened. I think it slipped away. Uh, by the way, I'm, st I'm disappointed to say I'm starting not to feel the spark between them anymore. I think they truly have broken up, and the best they can hope for is exes who remain friends. And that makes me sad, but I guess that's like real life. Uh, how is it that Sylvie remembered him, whereas others did not? I mean, it can't be because she was pruned at one point, because so was Mobius, and Mobius didn't remember him. Uh, but she wasn't pruned from all time. I guess it's because she and Loki are gods, so that's why she remembered him, but she was still reset to the new timeline she had chosen. And she kept He Who Remains as Tempad. I thought that's what that bracelet was, uh, which I guess she enchanted to look like a bracelet. Uh, by the way, the pattern that they put on it reminded me of Enchantress's leggings, and some of us have always felt that Sylvie was like a combo of Loki and Enchantress. Uh, anyway, uh, Sylvie gets Loki to realize at the bar that he doesn't really care about the TVA or time or even he who remains. He really just likes having friends and a purpose. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but as I said, I think deep down, all of them feel that way. The whole group does, which is maybe why they're drawn to each other. They're all lost and alone on their timelines. Sylvie, too. I think she just, you know, hasn't realized it yet because she spent so much of her her whole life pretty much off the timelines. So now that she's on one, she's just kind of enjoying that. But you can see when she's at the record store, this is not really enjoying it. So I think she would have eventually gotten there. But, you know, the timelines fading or spaghettifying hurried her up too. Oh, that's interesting. 
But then, so then when she was at the record store, to me, the episode got real Guardians of the Galaxy-like. I mean, they were focusing on a ragtag group of friends led by a grown-up acting like a child who loves a woman who doesn't love him anymore. Oh my God, it's so similar. And then, of course, a very strong music vibe. That was a cool shot when the timeline started to unravel and they, they had the camera go around with the record. That was cool. I did like that shot. Uh, but as many of you tweeted, they went all Infinity War with Loki's friends disappearing in front of him, spaghetti style like Victor Timely. But Loki, he missed the snap as he sacrificed himself at the beginning of that movie. So uh, now, now, now he gets to experience the same heartbreak. So he loses everyone. Mobius, by the way, wanting to get back to his sons right before he disappeared. That was tough to hear. That got me. I was like, ooh. That was haunting. And Loki, desperately trying to grasp and hold on to what he finally had. A family. You know, friends, but really a family. In fact, in that moment, he hears Sylvie's statement. I think it was from season one, but, you know, X5 said the same thing to him earlier this season. And that's that what makes a Loki a Loki is that they're destined to lose. And that was when Loki, our Loki, hit rock bottom. And that's when he finally gained control of his time slipping. It was great to see Loki throughout the episode, by the way, first so out of control, actually haunting himself. I just got that when I was doing my notes for this episode. That's really what they set up, that Loki was haunting himself, and that's beautiful. But then as he gets the hang of things and starts to figure it all out, he becomes more and more in control and more self-confident. This whole season, we've been thinking something was off. Loki you know, season one, Loki was running, but here, Loki has been lost. He, has been, he hasn't been driving. He's been a passenger, and I think it's because he was afraid to drive because he's always driven off, the, off a cliff in the past, but suddenly, he's forced to take the wheel because there's nobody left in the car. Oh, I'm loving this. So now, then he gains control of time slipping. He can rewind, which he does, which, which we've seen the TVA be able to do, incrementally, as he gets the hang of it, he go, keeps, keeps kind of going back a little bit more and more to eventually, right before Victor Timely ran out the gate in episode four, right when he went downstairs to put the suit on. And that sets the stage for episode six, the final episode of the season, which I guess is going to be a do-over. I hope they don't spend too much time on the do-over. And I'm a little bit bummed they're going to undo, obviously, the death of Victor Timely because um, I thought that was a really great moment. But well, let's see. I mean, let me see it first before I uh, disparage it. Although I, I, I'm nervous. All right, so other things to note. The opening sequence, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but it literally strips down Loki to a blank space and then itself resets. A little bit like Miss Minutes last episode, right? But when it resets, I think that's all the same font. I'm not totally sure, but I think that might be what they're going for. Also, in the automat, when he's looking around at first, is there no pie? Either that or the lights are just out back there, but I like to think there's no pie. A true sign of the apocalypse. Uh, also, kudos to the VFX team for some beautiful moving imagery, especially when the record store started to spaghettify, which I guess in a way is fitting, right? Trippy, man. Like when that window started to go, oh, that was incredible. That was really great. Uh, so, uh, and also when that guy, when the, the guy who worked there was running away and he was surrounded by that. And also when uh, Sylvia had the time door and she opened it at the last minute and was able to go through, that was really cool stuff. So what did you think of Loki episode five? Uh, when you first watched it and now that we've discussed it, right? Did you have the same epiphany as me or are you better at letting your guard down emotionally? Uh, and what do you think, why do you, as I said, why do you think Loki and Mobius are drawn to each other? With just one episode left to go, what do you think and or hope is going to happen? Oh, I'm nervous. I hope they wrap it up really well. But this was a, gr I, I told you when I, I first, at first I wrote it off. I was as frustrated as Loki. I was like, forget it. You guys all suck. But then when I let my guard down, I could see the beauty in it. And I think that it, emotionally connected with fans and the audience in a way that the rest of the season has not, which is why it finally trended. Isn't that cool? I hope that Marvel pays attention to that as well. Uh, all right, so share your thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.